I'd like to welcome everybody to the 949th monthly meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. We were established in 1934 um, and have grown over the decades uh, along with the um, Bond Astronomical Society that joined the group back in the early 1970s. We're now one of the largest uh, astronomy clubs and oldest astronomy clubs um, certainly in the land. Um, welcome everybody tonight. We have a, I think we're gonna have a great meeting. Our, our speaker is Sarah Sega, and she's gonna speak about Venus as a potentially habitable world. So let's begin. Um, there's my little clicker, there it goes. So of course the, the agenda is the same as it is every month. And so I won't, I won't roll through it all that much. But what I'd like to do before we get too deep into things is just talk briefly about COVID. Um, uh, Mario was just wondering uh, if we were, if, if I thought that we'd be back live at the CFA by May, and it all depends on what Harvard has to say. I, I, uh, I speak with uh, Charlie Hickey about once every two to three months to see where we're at. And right now it's still closed to outside groups. Um, I'm thinking if, if the trend continues with COVID, that maybe, maybe, maybe um, we'll be back there by September. It all depends on, I think it depends on the legal people. Um, I was talking with Steve Clardy today, and I'm sure he'll address this when we get up to the clubhouse report, but we were, to, we were hopeful that by the summer, the clubhouse can be operating as it used to, with people having access to inside and get back into the merry grinding and monthly work parties and um, A members on duty Friday and Saturday nights and try to bring things back to uh, what it used to be. So fingers crossed, we'll see how that all goes. We'll certainly keep you, everyone in the loop. Glenn, this is you're up and I'm up as the with the observing committee, and this is a this is certainly an awkward look, uh, an awkward view of the solar system. Um, Glenn, you're with us, right? Yes, I Glenn. am. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay. Well, Tom McDonough started this. He did this thing about sending jokes to Glenn Chapel, and uh, I put out something about uh, flat Earth society, and that seemed to catch on. So I found this on. Uh, online well this is awkward and it shows a solar system with a flat earth there Makes and sense. we'll go to the next we'll go to the next slide <laughs> and i quote consider con continuing with the flat earth the flat earth and they, read this now and listen to it the flat earth society announced it is members all over the globe and that comment came from patricia patricia lockwood who's an american essayist and apparently it's a true statement. They said they have members all over the globe and yet they say there is no globe, it's a flat earth. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. Uh, next slide. I'm, I jiggled your slides around a little bit. Okay, well, we did have Minor Planet 1994 PC1 make a passage. Fortunately, it didn't do that. But several of the members uh, uh, did make observations of this particular planet. I saw it myself. And it was tough because it was almost full moon. Now here's an image Doug Paul took and somebody commented that looked like Morse code and it is. If I can get uh, Rich to point to the very bottom left there. Down here? Yes, there's the, that's the letter D. Go to the next one up. Wait, wait, let me. Uh, okay, yeah, we're gonna oh, right follow here? that. That's D-O-N-T-L-O-O-K. <laughs> U P, don't look up. Nice. <laughs> well, this thing was about a, uh, I think it was a kilometer, about a half mile across. And uh, if it had hit the earth, there would have been some major damage. It wouldn't have been an extinction event, but it would, would, would have been uh, right up there. So uh, fortunately we got people monitoring these things. And this is one that uh, Mark Helton took. Uh, this of course the camera was held still and you can see the trail made by the asteroid and I did send uh, Rich I sent a couple of uh, little film clips was it able to work or not no I couldn't get it to work I didn't think they would but uh, um, both Mark uh, and Doug Paul got some really nice uh, images and if they I, if they if they're listening in please put them on at mob announcer at mob discuss just to show those film clips because they really need showing the actual motion of the asteroid across that field of view Neat object, to say the least. Uh, anybody else get to see that visually? I know, Rich, you saw it, didn't you? I did not, actually. If, if anybody's interested, I could probably try to share the video at the very end of the meeting, if you'll let me share the screen. Sure, we can do I that. could just share it from my screen. So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe when the meeting's over, if anybody's interested, I'll play that. It's just okay. about, it's only about 30 seconds. 
All right, Mark, remind me, okay? Yes, very nice, Mark. By the way, thanks Thank for you. sharing. I wish I could have gotten it on the uh, mm -hmm. website, but I know these are kind of tough sometimes to show these things with the slide deck. So we'll continue on. All right, so here are the monthly highlights. And Rich, I'll let you run these. You put the show together. I'll, I'll oh. interject now and then. Well, there were lots of little things that are going on this month that I thought people might be interested in. Like um, today's the 10th, so tomorrow night, um, a, a pretty bright moon will be two and a half degrees to the northwest of M35, um, right around sunset. Um, Saturday evening, green, uh, during Saturday, Venus reaches greatest brilliancy, minus magnitude, uh, magnitude minus 4.9. Try to pick that up in the daytime sky. That should be pretty easy to do. Um, on Sunday, uh, Venus is six and a half degrees north of Mars and Mercury is 14 degrees east of Mars. These are low in the southeast at sunrise, but that might be a nice little grouping. Um, Algo reaches a minimum brightness on Monday night, uh, this coming Monday of the 14th at 7.56 p.m. Um, on the 16th, Mercury reaches greatest elongation west, 26 degrees. Um, May I interject just for a second? Yep, of course, of course. Yeah, just jump back on Monday the 14th. That's Valentine's Day. Ah, uh, yes. So if you don't remember your significant uh, other, not only will Algol be at minimum, but your rom romantic life will be at minimum as well. So don't forget your significant other on Valentine's Day, the 14th, while Algol is going through its minimum brightness. That's right. On your way to the doghouse, grab the binoculars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I knew I couldn't get past a variable star without, without going yeah. chiming in. Um, on Sunday, the 27th, there'll be a nice grouping of the moon, Mars, and Venus. Um, together at sunrise. Again, these are all low in the southeast uh, just before sunrise. On Wednesday, March 2nd, Mercury is 0.7 degrees south of Saturn at sunrise, very low again. And new moon occurs that day at 12.35 p.m. Um, on Friday, March the 4th, Jupiter is finally in conjunction with the sun and um, leaves the evening sky for this year, um, uh, at, at least for now. Um, it'll, in a month or so, we'll be able to pick it up again in the morning sky. And somewhere six months or so from now, I'll start pumping out my Great Red Spot and transit uh, announcements um, as we get, uh, so you can get out there and look at that stuff as well. On March 6th, Uranus is 4.8 degrees northeast of the moon. Algol is again at a minimum brightness at 9.39 p.m. Um, the, on Tuesday, March 8th, the moon is 4.3 degrees southeast of the Pleiades. Um, the moon is first quarter on the 10th. Daylight savings time begins at 2 a.m. on Sunday, March 13th. And then I put these last two items on there just in case people are interested. Between February 17th um, and March 13th, the International Space Station is visible um, in the morning skies before sunrise. And uh, likewise, from uh, February, 22nd, uh, tw February 21st through March 9th, Tiangong, the Chinese space station, is visible before sunrise as well. And of course, heavensabove.com. Um, is a, a great source for predictions. Um, don't forget to uh, put your own address in there and, um, and you don't see that stuff. If you happen to be awake and you don't know what to do with yourself, go out and look at the space station go by. It's kind of fun wave. There are lots of people on board. Anyway, I saved this as a separate slide, Glenn. Why don't you cover this? I, this, I know Bruce Berg is the one that got me involved with this particular website. There's a website that does predictions for uh, asteroid occultations, and they're fairly rare events. I know a big one some of you may have been familiar with, I know it was about four or five years ago, was uh, um, Regulus, first magnitude star in Leo, was supposed to be occulted by an asteroid, and the path went right up the East Coast, and I was looking forward to a drive out to New York State to see it that time. That would, That's a very rare event when you have a, a first magnitude star occulted by an asteroid. And what we would have seen was you would have looked at um, Leo with the naked eye, and you would have seen that star disappear. I forget how many seconds it was going to disappear, but that would have been an amazing event. And of course, the rarer the event, the more likely the clouds are going to be. I think the whole entire East Coast, uh, all the way along that track was clouded out that particular night, so we all missed that. This one isn't quite as bright, but it's an asteroid that's about 14th magnitude. It'll occult a 12th magnitude star. And that's going to happen on Friday, March 11th. And if you look at the path over there, it goes right through central Massachusetts. Now, I forget on this one, I think the, the percentage rate, if you were near the center of that path, was about a 99% chance you'd see this. So uh, I'll have more information. These paths do get ad adjusted now and then. So hopefully the path will still be right there uh, for us. Uh, as this, this event approaches. So I'll keep you posted at a particular time, but this could be a very interesting event, especially for the uh, 
the Middleman Observatory, maybe to track this down. Again, Bruce Berger would probably be on top of this event as well. You know, if you're going to try to do it visually, um, um, you'll need um, a pretty deep star atlas. But um, the, these diagrams are from the International um, Occultation Timing Association's website. And there are finder charts um, on there that you can click, 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 and get closer and closer and closer to the star field. 11.7th magnitude is a relatively faint star. Um, you could argue from a dark sky, it might be visible in a four to six inch telescope, but it seems to me that from Eastern Massachusetts, uh, a tenth mag a 10 inch telescope might be required to comfortably see that star. Um, I don't know that you want to go deep enough to see the 13.9th magnitude asteroid, because what you really want to look for is that 12th magnitude star just winking out for 2.9 seconds if you're on the center line and then winking right back on again. Um, I think the Middleman Observatory can handle this, I, but that would be up to the, the folks that operate that system. But we just wanted to make you all aware of this. Um, so that's not till next month, but um, it's something to look forward to, I think. I'm gonna try and watch it myself. Um, these are, rel they're, they're not super rare, but it's rare for any given location on the earth to experience such an event. And so as you can see, the path cuts right through Massachusetts, at least the path as of today, as they refine the orbit of the asteroid, uh, as we get closer to the event, it might shift that path, but uh, keep that in the back of your mind. We'll mention it again at the March meeting, um, just to remind you. Um, this month's object, Glenn, you wanna do this? Whoops, yeah. now I've lost my cursor, hold on. There we go. We <laughs> ready? Yep. Uh, yeah, this is a, you might wonder, what is the Orion Nebula doing as an observer's challenge? But there are a number of elements to a challenge on this particular one. Uh, first of all, uh, and I can always forget this, M43 is a lot fainter than M42. M42 is naked, it's about fourth magnitude. M43, and I, I tend to question this, but a lot of my resources call it ninth magnitude, but I've seen it with a little 20, uh, 60 millimeter refractor, so I think it's brighter than that. I know the central star is something like a sixth or seventh magnitude star. But anyway, I was focusing more, me being the, um, uh, the double star observer, was that the heart of the nebula is a trapezium. It's a little cluster or a multiple star uh, made up of four bright stars. And I have to have my notes here just to remember this. They're labeled A through D um, by right ascension. Most of the times when you have a double star or a multiple star system, the brightest star is the A component and then B, C, D, fainter and fainter. But this one, they just went from uh, west to east right across. The A star is a variable star. It's an eclipsing variable, magnitude 6.7 to 7.5. B is also an eclipsing variable, and that's the faintest member of the system, 8.0 to 8.5. C is the brightest member at 5.1 magnitude and D is next at 6.7. These are all very hot stars. In fact, the C star is an O type star. I believe it's an O6 or O7, which is a very hot star. And one of the hottest stars that we can see in our, our particular neighborhood, but it's a neat little group. The challenge, and here's where you get some challenges, with a small telescope, with my little 60 millimeter refractor, sometimes it's hard to see the B component. The first time I have observed this nebula, I made a sketch and I just had the three stars. It is visible though, the 60 millimeter refractor, but the ones that are challenging are the E and F components. And um, these are both about 10th magnitude, but they're only about four or five arc seconds from these brighter stars. So that's a tight double star. So you'll really need, I would start with a six inch scope and very high magnification. And definitely you'd want some steady seeing to catch that. But that would be the, the to me, the challenge of that particular nebula. Now we have a couple of images and I know I can see Chris in the screen there. Uh, the next, we'll go to the next image was taken by Chris. And if Chris can, I guess, get in, we'll let him describe these two pictures. Yeah, sure. So this is uh, data that we should took with the early on with the Middleman uh, in this this fall uh, when um, when we first got the automation working on the observatory. Um, so these are let's see, they were sixty second exposures in hydrogen, alpha, sulfur two, and oxygen, and so the right side used the the traditional uh, Hubble palette. Um, and uh, we, let's see, it was a total of one hour uh, for each uh, narrowband filter. 
Uh, and the left, the left one is the same data, but I tried to do approximate real color. It was much more difficult than I anticipated. It's the first time I've ever tried to do it. So that's, mm. um, but uh, I also took some really short exposures for getting star colors. So I had some exposures, which were down in like the 20 milliseconds uh, time, which I made to uh, be able to grab the colors for all the stars. Um, but it was uh, it's interesting and I'm learning a lot, trying to get the, get what we can out of the MAO. <laughs> Nicely right. done. Uh, these are images by Mario with his 32 inch telescope. And I keyed in there again, this is a wide field view. So it's hard to maybe key in on the uh, on the trapezium, it shows the trapezium on the right, but you can see the four bright stars. You can just catch on the edge of two of the stars there, those 10th magnitude components. Uh, is Mario there to discuss his pictures? Yep, I'm here. What's your okay. question? Yep, this was with the 32, it's zoomed in. <clears throat> There's the E and the F star. Um, it, in order to get that, I had to get <clears throat> short exposures. I think these were all three second exposures. And you can see it's probably still overdone. I probably should do it again with one second exposure, just Laura, for the that, stars. This looks like the G star right here. Yeah, yeah. but it, 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 the big right stars there. are bloated. So yep. I really should do it at one second uh, exposures in order to <clears throat> minimize the size of the stars. And that was through a um, H alpha oxygen and sulfur filter. That's what those colors are. If you try to, you know, as Glenn said, you, you think this is a, we, it's probably the first deep sky object many of us looked at and you think, well, what's to, what's to see in, in the Orion Nebula? But if you've got a dark sky um, or employ filters, the detail is almost overwhelming um, in, yeah. the, in the richest areas of this nebulosity. The green color is outstanding. And with a, a fairly, with a moderate sized telescope, if you've got really dark skies, look to see if you can see hints of red. And again, the fifth and sixth stars of the trapezium are always a challenge. Um, it's, an, it's an outstanding object and, and it, it is very extensive. Uh, well, you guys so, got that 28 inch. I mean, through my 32, I can see greens, reds, and a little touch of blue. So yep. you should be able to do that with the 28. The, the 25 at the clubhouse, right? We should, see yeah. some, we should see some red definitely there. And yeah, that come up and, hard. you know, again, if the nights, if the air is really nice and steady, you know, take a look at and see if you can spot these guys here, uh, the, the E and the F star, the fifth and sixth stars. And if you, and with the 25, we should also try to image or visualize that G star right there. So pretty good. Those are beautiful shots. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mario. What, what impresses me is a lot of the old time exposures, you couldn't see the trapezium. If you exposed long enough to get the nebulosity, it swamped off the, uh, the, the stars in the trapezium. So both those shots that... Uh, uh, Chris and Mario talk, you see the nebula as well as a trapezium. And I think we have another one here from Doug Paul. If he's available, he can uh, talk about his pictures. Is Paul there, Doug? Okay, apparently not, but there's a wide view of the Orion Nebula that he took. And over here is a close-up of the trapezium. You definitely see the E and F stars. I'm not sure right. if G uh, I don't see the shows. G star in there, but the, and, and these stars look easy in this picture. They're not. That the, these these stars here, um, the A and the C stars are pretty bright compared to these little guys, and they're these are challenging to see. Um, like Len said, pick a night with steady seeing to see if you can pick those out. But they're fun to look at. That's a great shot. These everybody, they're nice job. You oh guys. yeah, fabulous. Yeah, kudos to uh, our yeah. astro images in the club. We were able to do this when the moon isn't in the way, I guess. So I guess that's thank it. you very much. And I think that concludes the talk. So as always, uh, keep looking up, stay safe. All right, Glenn, thank you. All right, and that brings me to this month's speaker, Dr. Sarah Seeger uh, from MIT is gonna speak on the top. Her topic is Venus as a potentially habitable planet. Um, she is the professor of physics and planetary science at the MIT and her research ranges from the detection of exoplanet atmospheres to innovative theories about life on other worlds to, develop, to the development of novel space mission concepts. She was the deputy science director of the MIT-led NASA space mission TESS and is currently focused on developing a Venus life finder mission. Her groundbreaking research earned her a, McCarthy, a MacArthur Genius Grant and she is also an officer of the Order of Canada, a member of the US 
National Academy of Sciences and has asteroid 9279, currently shining at magnitude 19.7 in the constellation of Pisces, um, named in her honor. Sarah, we're pleased to have you with us tonight. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, so that you can start sharing your screen. And I know everybody's muted, but I'm sure you're getting a, a rousing, a thunderous round of applause from all the members. Okay. So thanks, thanks for being everyone. here tonight, Sarah. And um, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. All right, great. So hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? I can hear you just fine. Oh, all right. So some I'm of you- mute, heard, I'm going to mute myself too. Some of you have seen this talk already. I just added one or two new things a little later um, in case you have seen it already. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about Venus as a potentially habitable world. But first I wanna start a lot longer ago uh, with the backstory from billions of years ago when these, actually it turned out this slide is somewhat wrong right now because I just heard a lunch talk today where they said photosynthesis actually started before cyanobacteria, uh, way before. And it's just really interesting that somehow small, simple, single-celled life forms on earth figured out something amazing, how to capture energy from the environment and exploit that for their own use. So in here, I'm talking about photosynthesis. And what's amazing about that was life generated oxygen, which filled our atmosphere eventually to 20% by volume. So what's really interesting, this kind of thought I like to carry with me is if there is an intelligent alien civilization on a planet orbiting a nearby star, with the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build and they're looking back at earth, they'll see oxygen and they'll be really scratching their heads about it because oxygen is a very highly reactive gas and it shouldn't be in our atmosphere unless it's being continually, observed, uh, continually produced actually. So just hold that thought with you, you for a moment. It wouldn't be alien seeing you know, the Great Wall of China or city lights, it'll be a gas that shouldn't be there because it's so reactive. And that's what we're looking for in other worlds. So I'm gonna give you an introduction. And what I'm going to focus on is phosphine on Venus. I'm gonna give you an update on the story about Venus and uh, where we're at with phosphine, what, we're, what the latest ideas are about Venus as a potentially habitable world. I'm gonna talk more about Venus uh, after I finish with phosphine. So just for a very brief intro, uh, I just wanted to talk, mostly I work on exoplanets and I have this quote that I found like 15 years ago. And this quote I really carry with me because when I did mention oxygen and today it fills our atmosphere to 20% by volume, it turns out that um, for most of Earth's life, uh, for most of Earth's history, oxygen wasn't very prominent actually. You know, it was started to be produced billions of years ago, but it took a long time before it could accumulate in the atmosphere. So one of the things that my research team works on is gases. What kind of gases should we be on the lookout um, in other work uh, on exoplanets when we're ready and when we have the capability to search for gases that don't belong, that might be a sign of life. And I don't have time to get into like my big research program, but this image is supposed to capture for you that there are so many molecules out there and we have computer programs to sort through all of them. And we're slowly, slowly working through all the classes of molecules that we want to have on our menu of options to you know, be aware that uh, it might be a sign of life somewhere, somehow. So one of these gases uh, that popped out of our, our search is phosphine. And phosphine is, it is a phosphorus, it's the element phosphorus P attached to three hydrogen atoms. That's what this little cartoon is on the left here. And a lot of you probably know that phosphorus is an essential element for all life on earth. But here on earth, it's used by life as phosphate. That's a phosphorus attached to oxygen atoms. Because here on earth, you know, we don't have very much hydrogen. We don't have very much, um, you know, earth, our planet can't hold on to hydrogen. And what hydrogen we do have is like already locked away in water and other things. And what's also interesting about phosphine is sort of initially on a quick look, it appears to be like not really used by life. And so initially uh, people didn't like phosphine as a sign of life because it's toxic to us humans. It was used in World War I as a chemical warfare agent. Um, we don't know exactly how life makes phosphine. 
And, but it turns out that you can have some counter arguments to these. Um, it's not, phosphine is not poisonous. It's not toxic to life, um, some life in some oxygen free environments. And it turns out there's incredibly strong evidence that life produces phosphine. It's found in wetlands in oxygen, in these oxygen free environments, such as wetlands and sludges. People see phosphine coming off, measure phosphine coming off of back, mixed bacterial cultures in the laboratory. It's found in um, animal guts, like a, above penguin colonies, penguin poop. There's a lot of phosphine. So this is a kind of curious thing. Um, phosphine, it is only associated with life on Earth. Either the examples I gave you or made by us humans. So that's sort of setting the stage as to why we care about phosphine. Now, the story about phosphine on Venus itself actually starts about five or six years ago. And this is a project led by Professor Jane Greaves in the United Kingdom. And so sometimes in science, you know, we reserve part of our time to do something risky and kind of out there for the joy of exploring. And Professor Jane Greaves is a radio astronomer. I'm showing you a picture here of the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. And she actually wanted to search for signs of life on Venus. And to her credit, she looked through the literature, like journal articles. And she also came across phosphine, which is pretty weird, by the way, to have two separate astronomers, like separated across the ocean, working on phosphine as a possible sign of life, myself on exoplanets and Professor Jane Greaves and her team for Venus. And phosphine worked out because it actually has a absorption feature. It, it um, interacts with light at millimeter wavelengths where she is an expert at observing. So I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, but why is it so awkward to want to search for signs of life on Venus? Well, uh, yeah, Venus is very bright. And I saw earlier someone was talking about when we can see Venus in the night sky. Well, due to a massive carbon dioxide greenhouse atmosphere, Venus's surface is too hot for any kind of life, like just period, unequivocally, because it's too hot for um, most complex molecules that any kind of life would need. So the surface is out, but just like here on Earth, if you hike or climb or fly above the surface, it gets colder and colder and colder. And the same is true on Venus. So way above the surface, about 50 kilometers above, the temperature is much cooler than the surface and it's actually just right for life. In fact, at that altitude, the temperature and pressure is very similar to what we have around us here on earth. So since Carl Sagan, half a century ago, people have speculated about life in Venus, but this is life in the clouds. And what's interesting about Venus is unlike here on earth where our clouds are very fragmented, I don't know if anyone was watching the weather today. Like I got to my office really early, like at 6 a.m. And I could see the sunrise, like just a little sliver. And there's a big cloud bank over the ocean. And then um, it cleared up actually. And then it was so foggy, like I couldn't see anything out my window, which overlooks the Charles River and the Boston city skyline. And it was so strange because later in the day, it was bright and sunny again. <laughs> Well, on Venus, unlike here on Earth where we have fragmented clouds and they come and go, on Venus, it's always cloudy. The clouds are um, engulf the entire planet and they're very extensive vertically, like 20 kilometers deep or something. And so the idea is that there are bacteria, that's the kind of hypothesis or speculation floating around in the clouds. Now here on Earth, we have life in our clouds temporarily because our clouds are so fragmented our bacteria gets swept up from the surface and gets inside cloud droplets and stays there for maybe a week or so before getting dropped back down. So that's kind of why people want to believe, but this cloud layer in Venus, it's still a terrible place for life no matter how you look at it. The cloud layer is very dry. You know, there's very little water vapor and the droplets aren't water. They're actually concentrated sulfuric acid, we think. And that's bad, very bad for life. I actually have this little video I picked up for you. I'm gonna play it just so you can see. You know, this is showing you, don't try this at home, but if you put sugar into sulfuric acid, this is gonna show you what happens. And that sugar you can think of as like part of DNA. 
So if you put any of our life into sulfuric acid, it doesn't do very well. This is like a- Start by filling a glass here. container about a third of the way full with either granulated or powdered sugar. Now pour in roughly the same volume of concentrated sulfuric acid, but be careful. Concentrated sulfuric acid is one of the most corrosive compounds out there and can cause instantaneous tissue damage. At this point, carefully stir the mixture until it's the same throughout and then watch what happens. The sulfuric acid breaks apart the bonds that holds the sugar molecule together, converting it into elemental carbon and water. But again, be careful because sulfuric acid is one of the most dangerous compounds out there and you need to make sure to use proper safety protocols. That's pretty nasty. And it turns out that most things, like most life will just dissolve in sulfuric. I actually know this for a fact. It's um, because one of my sons, you know, during that first pandemic summer, like there were no jobs, no sports, nothing to do. And he got a job with one of my colleagues and did some experiments at home. But some things do survive, like this waxy leaf, you know, the rhododendron that we have all outside. If you put that leaf in sulfuric acid, it actually survives for a while. The wax is resistant to sulfuric acid. Uh, graphite, like that you find in pencils, sulfur. You know, so one idea is that life living inside these cloud droplets has a protective shell of some kind of material. Wax, by the way, if you put like pure wax and sulfuric acid, it survives, it doesn't break down. So we don't really know what's out there. But back to the story, because my team was working on phosphine, Professor Jane Greaves was working on it, a mutual contact connected our two teams. And she asked if we wanted to work with her. And we said yes. And I was going to say the rest is history, but it's something that's still unfolding. So um, she did find a signal with the James Cook Maxwell telescope and wanted to confirm it using a more powerful telescope. So we helped her propose to get time on ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile. It's like around 17,000 feet high above, um, you know, high up where it's very dry so that water vapor like doesn't interfere with observations. And there's about 60, 60 like dishes that all work together. So that was sort of the start of the story. And I'm sure a lot of you remember about, um, it was in September, 2020. And that was after a number of years of really hard work on the data. We actually reported that we found phosphine on Venus. Now we're not claiming we found life on Venus. We're claiming that we've detected phosphine gas whose existence is a mystery. Just like on earth, on Venus, there's very little, little to no hydrogen. And the temperatures and pressures do not favor phosphine. Okay. It turns out Jupiter and Saturn have phosphine, but there they have a lot of hydrogen. And as you go think about beneath the atmosphere of Jupiter, it's very, very hot actually at temperatures that favors the formation of phosphine. But on Venus, it's just, you know, we literally wrote a hundred page paper investigating all the possible chemical pathways. We didn't find anything. So it leaves room for the idea that there might be life there. Maybe there's life making phosphine. So that was kind of where we're at. And we investigated quantitatively a, scenarios that could generate phosphine. You don't have to read all these. It's really just here to sort of indicate uh, all the work we did. Volcanoes, meteors, lightning, surface minerals. Some of these can indeed produce phosphine, but not very much of it. And not enough to match the observed values. So I sort of debated whether I should put any data in here. This is a bit complicated to explain, but I'll just do it briefly. And you don't have to understand this slide to understand the rest of the talk. This was the original reported data. What you're looking at is um, radio wave data at millimeter wavelengths. And what you're looking at here, it's these radio astronomers want to just call this a line to continuum ratio, where continuum is this um, outside the line and this drop here is the line. On the bottom, instead of showing frequency, they convert it to a Venus rest frame velocity. I have no idea why they like this convention. There's probably a good reason that I just don't know. And what you're looking at is, I want you to think of Venus, the sunlight hits Venus and Venus absorbs that energy from the sun. And some of that sunlight, by the way, is reflected, some is absorbed, but the absorbed radiation is reprocessed and eventually emitted. Just like touching the pavement on a hot day, right? It absorbs sunlight, it heats up and it emits. So Venus is emitting this reprocessed sunlight, but 
in that radiation, that's that emission coming off of Venus, some molecules will absorb. I always think of it like the molecules are taking a bite out of the radiation leaving the planet. And what you're seeing here, if you can agree with me that this is different from a straight line, I mean, there's ups and downs due to noise, but this drop here, it's right exactly um, where phosphine should be. That made like a really, that was like three years of work in like a few sentences. But the bottom line is this is due to phosphine rotating um, and it's ground to first excited state. And it's kind of complicated, but we, um, you know, the analysis part of the team did find a signal with two independent telescopes, the James Cook Maxwell Telescope and the ALMA Observatory. And these line measurements popped up with various kinds of processing and the overlap of the spectra, you know, there were spectra, there weren't any other, um, you know, negative features in the data that showed up for both data sets. And models inferred about 20 parts per billion. But a lot happened after the phosphine came out. It's incredibly controversial today. And many scientists don't believe there's a signal of phosphine there at all. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the main complaints and tell you a bit about what happened uh, since the announcement and where we stand today. Because if you Google phosphine on Venus, everything you read will say it's not there. In fact, today on Facebook, I saw this long article in Dutch. <laughs> I can't read Dutch, but I believe it was saying there's no phosphine and it was highlighting one of the authors who wrote a paper saying there's no phosphine, you know, that they didn't recover the signal. So people just think it's, I'll get there. Okay, so one complaint was that there's only one line. I showed you that one drop in brightness. Usually people want to see many lines, like a fingerprint. Like imagine if we tried to identify you based on like a fraction of a fingerprint. Like surely it would be better to have all 10 fingerprints because you know it could be a different molecule. So that was one complaint, only one line. And um, that's a problem of course, but that's all that's available at these wavelengths. So a related comment was it's probably a contaminant. In fact, sulfur dioxide has a line very close to the phosphine line. And so some people wrote papers saying it's sulfur dioxide. But Professor Jane Greaves discovered that someone had used one of the, um, someone had used um, the telescope, I wanna say it was ALMA, but I can't remember if it was ALMA or, G or the JCMT, to observe sulfur dioxide at a different wavelength, literally a few days before our own observation. And using that information, we're able to demonstrate that sulfur dioxide would have had to increase like by a factor of 10 in a few days, which like has never been seen before in order for it to also explain the signal we see that we're attributing to phosphine. So people also wanted to have chemical explanations and sure there might be one because we don't know all about the chemistry of phosphine. We don't know all about the conditions on Venus. And there are a couple of published papers more welcome, but there hasn't been too much activity in that area. Now, the main complaint was data analysis. You know, Venus is bright and beautiful, right? Well, it's actually not a great thing because big observatories like ALMA, they weren't designed to look at incredibly bright, spatially resolved objects, actually. And so there's a lot of noise, like uh, noise is kind of, in some sense, like amplified. So that was a problem. Um, we actually, like I said, we had two independent data sets. We did a lot of analysis. Uh, we detected other lines with our same procedure, but the data is all public because it comes from these large facilities. And so other teams analyzed the data and some of those teams did not recover the signal. And so this is the biggest pain point. Now, some of them did recover the signal therefore like published papers from independent teams contradict each other. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to all of this in a moment, in a couple of slides, but I first want to tell you something amazing. So motivated by this phosphine discovery, a person named Professor Rakesh Mogul decided to look at reanalyze um, data from Pioneer Venus, a NASA mission that went to Venus in the early, like late 19, like I think it was 1979 or 1980, and dropped a probe down in Venus. Now this is gonna be a really busy slide, so don't worry about the details. It's mostly here, so I remember to tell you stuff. But what this instrument was, one of the instruments was, is it sucked in gas and it ionized the gas. 
So it get popped off the electrons leaving the parent ions, which are now like charged. And it subject them to a magnetic field and how these particles move through the magnetic field, like how they get um, deflected by the magnetic field and how quickly they move, it allows you to tell um, like the mass and charge of the parent ion. So, wow, you can actually um, pick up a lot of information. Now, what's amazing too, is that Professor Rakesh Mogul, he was able to contact a man by the name of Richard Hodges, who's like in his nineties, who was working on that instrument. He was an engineer on the instrument because you know, a lot of the data we take uh, like 40 years later, like, do you think people can use it? It's hard. So good thing that he was still around and mentally sharp. So what's really interesting is Rakesh Mogul found um, parent ions of phosphine listed here, pH3, pH2, pH2D, P+. And he carefully worked through all the possibilities. You know, could it be like PCL3 or P4 or these other gases? And he has sort of logic as for why it's not. And one of the reasoning is that you have to have the right parent ions in the right proportion. So if you did had PCL3, he's explaining, you would expect to have this ion here, P plus CL, but they didn't find that. So when he works through all this, the conclusion is that the clouds of the middle clouds of Venus contain a gas containing phosphorus. Phosphine is the most likely gas that fits the data. Okay, so this isn't bulletproof, but wow. I mean, this is really, really um, good supporting evidence. So yeah, there's evidence for phosphine. So I wanted to tell you a bit more about the community response. I actually picked a very tame example here because people got very angry, so angry. And I haven't, uh, I'm not here, to, I'm only here to talk about astronomy. So I'll just tell you that many scientific authors just dismiss phosphine outright. And I picked something here where you can read it if you want to, but the point is to look at this highlighted data. But this, meaning this phosphine detection has now been convincingly refuted. And in the paper, in this article, they only cite one contesting paper. So what a colleague and I did recently, and this is sort of the latest kind of takeaway for you, not the details I'm gonna give you, but the overview that science is working. We have a back and forth. I'm gonna just walk you through this, okay? Um, you're not gonna hear about this anywhere else. We created like a kind of matrix. So this says phosphine data. And along the rows and columns, we're listing all the papers, every paper that's been published so far, on the data. So in the diagonal gray boxes, we're just giving you a snapshot summary of what the data is. So here's one. This was the Dutch article I think was talking about today. Reanalysis of ALMA data, no signal in ALMA data. So here on the white, um, on the you know row and column, we just give a reference of where you can, you know, where we've responded to it. Because I want you to know that the team I'm involved with led by Professor Jane Greaves has responded, you know, one by one to like every single criticism. So then if you wanted to know what our response is, it's a little too technical for you for tonight, but one of the things they complained about the way that we detrended the data and took noise away. So here our response was that we revisited the way we fit the data. We actually use newly calibrated data. We use different methods. All right, so I could spend a long time on this, but it's a bit confusing, um, but the point is we've created a spreadsheet detailing the community published papers, like independently analyzing the data and the Professor Jane Greaves et al team late, latest responses. And there's a lot, so there's a lot happening, right? Like, look at this, there's like 10 papers or something. Maybe half of them are criticizing the others. It's like a full-time job here for uh, mostly Professor Jane Greaves to respond to these. We also have one, like a similar table that if you look at the red here, phosphine interpretation. So I'll walk you through one example where um, this team, Trong and Lunin, they immediately put a paper out like within three or four days of our announcement that it's from volcanoes. However, they hadn't realized we had a companion paper that we put out at the same time as our discovery. This is a hundred page paper that worked through a lot of examples. So they retracted it after they realized that we had already said, we already explained that even though volcanoes might produce phosphine, it wouldn't be in enough quantity. So if we go along this table and see all the things, um, they actually finally put a paper out and then we responded to it. 
And if you want to see our response, it's not on here, but we end up saying that in order for a volcano to put phosphine high up in the atmosphere, like think about, um, we have a lot of volcanoes on earth, right? Um, and very few of them reach so high that planes can't fly. There was that one in Iceland a long time ago, but this has to be an even more powerful volcano than we've ever seen before. And sort of we work through a model showing why we argue why it's unlikely. Anyway, you can think we're all just fighting, but the point is that the science, there's a back and forth and it takes a long time for controversial things to kind of get settled. Um, just think about methane on Mars, you know, uh, 15 years ago, people thought they saw methane on Mars using large ground-based telescopes like Keck and others. And it took 15 years until Orbiter saw it, when Orbiter didn't, a rover landed and saw methane. And it's, you know, mostly believed, but still somewhat controversial. Okay, so anyway, this is still ongoing and we'll see. So I wanted to tell you some other wonderful things that have come out of this discovery of phosphine on Venus. This controversial phosphine on Venus, I'll just say. So here's an artist's impression of Venus, okay? It's like I said, a really crazy environment, not necessarily a great place uh, for life or for a planet to be habitable. But what's really interesting, if you start digging in Venus that now, phosphine has motivated people to do. What's really interesting is you find that there's a lot of anomalies, like things in the atmosphere that were never explained. And they were discovered by the Russians who sent many probes to Venus in the late 1970s and early 80s, and the American Pioneer Venus. Pioneer Venus was actually four separate probes that dropped in the atmosphere. So there's this mysterious ultraviolet observer uh, observer, mysterious ultraviolet absorber high in the atmosphere. People love to speculate that there's like photosynthesis going on and there's particles absorbing light, but it's no one knows what it is really. Um, in Venus, there have been some non-volatile elements like uh, phosphorus and iron have been discovered. It turns out that the particles, um, some of them are not spherical. And why is this so important? Because Concentrated sulfuric acid is a liquid and the liquid has to be spherical. So if there are non-spherical particles, there are actually, some particles are not pure concentrated sulfuric acid. That's incredibly intriguing because if there is life on Venus inside these particles, um, it, it can't be pure concentrated sulfuric acid. There's other stuff in there, but mostly there are gases that don't belong. Okay, not like oxygen here on earth that has modified our atmosphere to 20% by volume, but we've listed the gases here that um, are, have been detected. Some of them are tentative, like ammonia. Um, other gases people will argue might be contamination, but oxygen exists on Venus in the atmosphere at like the uh, tens of parts per million. And even that is really not explained. And if you look back in the literature, there was a lot of fighting going on. I don't know how angry they were back then, but it was the Russians and Americans actually. And you can read in this one paper that one of the set of Americans, they dismiss some of this data because they say it's out of equilibrium. That makes no sense. One of these measurements has to be wrong. It's wrong. So yeah, but later on that same group seemed to have um, you know, walked back a bit and agreed it's there. So you know, there's a lot of puzzles on Venus. And some of these might indicate habitable world. They might indicate there's life. Um, it's a lot. I had this sort of more complicated thing, but I think I'm gonna skip that for now. Instead, I wanted to tell you that I've been involved with leading a mission concept study. We spent about two years thinking through how could we go to Venus in a really uh, focused way with focused instruments and search to find out if Venus can be habitable or if there are signs of life there actually. And we finished this like 150 page report you can find if you want to read it. You could just read the first few pages in the executive summary. And there's like an entire chapter on these anomalies if you really wanted to dig into it, reviewing them and describing some theories about them. So in the midst of all this, all of this excitement, NASA selected two missions to go to Venus. And people have been proposing to go to Venus for like the four decades since NASA went to Venus before. They had an orbiter um, called Magellan. So 
that's pretty exciting that they're going to Venus, but searching for habitability and signs of life is actually still very taboo. Like it's still considered crazy and out there. And so to my knowledge, none of, neither of the missions um, are searching for anything to do with astrobiology. Also the way NASA works, if you make a proposal and it's selected, there's no, no wiggle room. Like it's already planned, demonstrated to be solid. And so you, you can't really just throw off your instrument and put a new one on. So that's where we're at. And so, and the Europeans also selected a mission. So there's three missions definitely going to Venus towards the end of this decade. So our first mission is a small privately funded mission. It's run by Rocket Lab. And Rocket Lab are basically building most parts of this, the rocket, the cruise vehicle, and the probe itself that's gonna drop down into Venus's atmosphere. This actually, uh, there's no parachute, it just drops down and it goes pretty fast. And the part we're interested in, it only lasts for three minutes. We're given a room for a low mass payload up to one kilogram. And so with all these constraints, we did find a really exciting instrument. Um, we have a vendor who's building it now and it has a complicated name. We call it a autofluorescing nephilometer. It always to me sounds like something to do with kidneys but nephilometer is something that measures cloud particles. Okay, so this nephilometer, what it's gonna do is shine a laser out of a window on the side of the probe. And that laser light is gonna scatter off of the cloud particles, backscatter. And the light scatters actually into different angles and different amounts of light scatter into different angles. And we also measure polarization. And how that light scatters into different angles, the polarized light especially, can actually tell you what the particle is made of. And in fact, NASA, uh, this already happened with the Russian and um, actually with Pioneer Venus, they already figured all this out and they're the ones who found that some of the particles appear to be non-spherical. But we're gonna go and repeat this and we're going to try to figure out what the particles are made of. Now, the new twist we have is that the laser, we've chosen it to be at an ultraviolet wavelength so that it can fluoresce particles. You know, black light, like if you're in a room, you know, um, it's more of like a thing for kids or like a nightclub, like black light and things will fluoresce. So this laser will excite electrons and they'll cascade back down and give off light. Now, if we detect fluorescence, it will be absolutely astonishing, stunning, really a stunning discovery because it means there's some complicated particles in there. Specifically, what's more likely to fluoresce, fluoresce are um, ringed particles because electrons just sort of move around and are loosely bound and more likely to be excited. So we have a target launch of May, 2023, and we're pretty excited about this. We have some other plans too that aren't yet funded. We'd like to send a balloon or another type of probe. And we have uh, a lot of details of what we wanna do. Um, I'm gonna summarize in a second, but I just realized I forgot to tell you one important thing. It's actually, um, I'm gonna try to explain this, but it could be that some of these cloud particles are not pure concentrated sulfuric acid. And if they're not, then their acidity is, uh, may not be so harsh. Remember the video with the sugar just kind of going wild? And this is amazing. There's sort of a number of lines of evidence that hint that this might be true actually. So we'd like to send a later mission to check out habitability. And one of the key factors will be to measure the acidity of these cloud particles. You know, we'd like to measure phosphine directly in the atmosphere, ammonia, and some of these other anomalous gases. So we can really try to find out what's going on. Now, just to sort of make a really long story short, if we ever wanted to identify life on Venus, we most likely have to bring a sample of the atmosphere back to Earth. Because like we can't bring a microscope that's sensitive enough to look for what we're looking for. And it's just hard to operate a, a microscope on a balloon and some of the other instruments, it's very complicated. So I hope one day, I don't know when, but this will happen and we'll be able to search for signs of life directly. All right, so to summarize, I'm gonna summarize this. Venus has many longstanding mysteries. Um, some have been measured directly in the atmosphere by probes from nearly 40 years ago. Some of these gases of interest, we talked about phosphine, there's also ammonia, water vapor and sulfur dioxide, just their vertical abundances aren't well explained. And also some of the cloud particles in the lower layers appear to be different from spherical, so they can't be pure concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, there's a new era for Venus exploration. There's three NASA ESA missions are going, but none of them are studying astrobiology. None are studying the cloud particles directly. 
We are searching for life or signs of life, and my team is aiming for a series of private or private public funded focus missions with international participation. And that concludes my talk, and thank you for your attention. Sarah, that was awesome. Can I ask a, a question or two? Sure. Um, how, how stable, you mentioned the oxygen in the atmosphere on the earth is you know, relatively unstable. Indeed, oxygen, like you said, is a very reactive molecule or a very reactive atom. How stable is phosphine? Would we expect it to last a long time in the atmosphere or is it something that would have to be regenerated? Yes, good. Thank you for mentioning that. It would have to be regenerated, yes. So that makes it very interesting because- Very interesting. And as the oxygen in Venus as well is unstable and would have to be generated. And ammonia- Sure, of course, there. of course. So yes, all of these things uh, are unlikely. Are, and yeah. I was gonna ask if, you know, when you, you mentioned that there were some folks that seem convinced that it's volcanic activity on Venus that's putting the phosphine into the atmosphere. Um, how active are the volcanoes on Venus? I, I don't remember reading anything about, I, I, I guess I would imagine that if there was a super volcano on Venus that erupted with enough energy to, you know, to flood that material to the, uh, to the atmosphere, I wouldn't, wouldn't do you think we would see signs of that on, from the earth? Um, like, um, like maybe, but it's disturbances. not, yeah. Right. I see what you're saying. Atmosphere disturbances on Venus possibly, but I do want you to know that there are volcanoes on Venus and they mm -hmm. are active actually. It's like crazy. Right. But yes. But not like Earth, like they're they're fewer and they're less active. Do, do we know the do we know what causes the volcanoes on Venus to, to be um, active? Yeah, I should know the answer to that, but I don't have anything popping into my head. Well, that's no worries. Yeah. Um, because it does the, Venus doesn't have tectonics, does it? No, because it doesn't have tectonics, yeah. Right, right. It's probably just general movement of material. Sure. Because really the tecton the tectonics on the earth require water. Right to, to lubricate right, the, right. the plates, our right. water, right? Um, so that's interesting. That phosphine is is um, not particularly stable. That's pretty cool. I, I, could you just again go over the the idea of non-spherical particles in the atmosphere? I mean, that that's interesting in itself. Uh, you know, you're right. If you have a liquid suspended in an atmosphere, you'd expect it to be spherical, right? Right, right. So the Pioneer Venus probe, you know, it dropped down. It had the, um, they didn't have lasers, but they shone the light out of the window and they measured what came back. And it didn't, some of it doesn't match spherical particles. And it also doesn't match a composition of concentrated sulfuric acid. <laughs> so that's kind of where they stopped, but they, they couldn't figure out what it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're hoping that there's something more interesting there. And now also, one thing I forgot to mention was since that time, one of the people on our team has a laboratory setting and has, you know, made sulfuric acid and stuck an organic molecule in there and lit it up with a laser. And that actually ended up generating like a rich organic chemistry in the droplets. So that doesn't mean that it's life per se, but you know, life uses those molecules. And this person imagines that a meteorite might have seeded, you know, shed some like carbon material that got in the droplets and that with ultraviolet light, you know, leads to this sort of rich chemistry. So there could be something like that going on. That's pretty interesting. You would think with a thick atmosphere like Venus has that it would be tough to get a, a, a meteoroid to reach the surface of Venus. Uh, it's not know. the surface though, remember? We're talking about the clouds. No, no that's what I mean. And so you, yeah. I, would, I would imagine that meteors would be a great, have great capabilities to seed the atmosphere of Venus. Right, well, I'm glad um, you're so supportive of <laughs> All the crazy ideas. So thank you. Well, you know, it's it. it they're they're not. A, if you'd asked me fifty years ago, or even ten years ago, what I thought about all the stuff, I'd probably be like, "Yep, that's too crazy to even think about." But you know, when you look at the at the um, the extremophiles on the Earth, the organisms that can live in just outrageous conditions, um, you, you have to let you, that has to open your mind up a bit to the possibility that yeah, you're right. You might find microbes or you know microbial life in the atmosphere of venus why not why not you know, look it, like we're, we're saying that you know sure yeah. why not i look? like what you're saying but just to sort of you know um tone it down a tiny bit you know we say like why not look like it's mm -hmm. close and if it's not life then wow i mean there's still some intricate chemistry that we just you know, overlook that maybe today we're ready to solve sure
Fabulous. Well, I'm sure other members have uh, have um, questions. So I'll, I usually wind up talking a lot. So I'm gonna be quiet for a bit and let other members ask questions. I know Mark Helton has his hand up. Mark, go ahead. There, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, a couple questions. Um, when you're doing the radio astronomy, uh, are you looking at a specific part of the atmosphere or are you looking at the whole planet or can you look at different, uh, can you target the radio astronomy enough that you can look at like sections of the atmosphere as opposed to just looking at the, the broad swath? That's, that's one question. Yeah. Well, we look at, yes. So the radio telescope and other telescopes, you can look at like strips of Venus basically. So, um, down into like, so just in two dimensions, you know, you kind of chop it up into strips and you can add those all together or investigate each one on its own. Okay. So are you now, going, are you going down at different levels too? So you're not, no, you're the looking. level, I mean, that's a little tricky one to, yeah. but you kind of go down as far as you can, you know, like it's really the atmosphere that's limiting you. You can't really control how far down you're looking. Okay. Like the phosphine, wherever it is, we'll see it. And we sort of try to back out where we saw phosphine because different parts of that line are generated in different parts of the atmosphere, but we need a model to kind of back out how far down we saw. It's like, it's not like, um, like the phosphine line exists at one frequency. So we can't like tune where we look to get deeper or shallower. Okay. It just kind of is what it is at that frequency. Okay. And my I other mean, question, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I don't I mean the only analogy I have is if you've ever walked on a frozen pond, like right in the fall when it freezes, you can see right to the bottom. Once I saw a turtle burrowing, it was getting ready, I guess, to, you know, whatever it does for the winter. But then, you know, when it all cracks and stuff, and then you like, you can't really see down at all. Like you didn't choose that. It's just what nature gave you. Right. But the radio astronomy, imagine that is like your eyes, like you couldn't choose how far you look. It's just whatever's in the atmosphere blocks or allows it to go deeper. Okay. And my other question is about the, the negativity. It, it seems like Mars, we've, we've spent billions and many nations have sent, you know, probes to Mars and um, in search of life. And yet we have a planet that's almost the same size as Earth. And yes, it's, it's inhabitable to us at the present time, but it seems like you know, you're right at, at the upper atmospheric levels there, there's, a, there's probably a lot more possibility of e either bacterial life or some form of life. And yet there's, from what you're saying, there seems to be a lot of negativity about, it's almost like Venus is a taboo. We go all the way out to Titan and send probes into Titan, but. Yeah. And like, there's something a little deeper here that I don't understand. Yeah. But supposedly it goes back to the Viking lander missions that set out to find life and thought they found it, then they didn't. And it's just kind of a mess. So for some reason, and I don't understand it myself, but, you know, Mars, Venus, not allowed, but yeah, Titan, right? And Europa. Right. It's okay to say you're searching for life. So I can't comment on that myself, but I appreciate you like bringing that observation to the group. Yeah, it, it just, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me because it seems like, you know, it's, cl it's close, it's perfect, yeah. you know, it's easy, relative, I mean, you're relatively easy to get there. Um, and you're, like you say, I was thinking, uh, I was reading uh, the latest uh, uh, An Andrew Weir book and they drag something through the atmosphere of the planet. Now, whether that's possible or not, where you could like have a spaceship that dropped something and dragged it through the upper atmosphere to collect samples. I mean, you would think that there would be that kind of, you know, way of finding, I guess you said the, the Russian probe or one of the probes did something where they kind of did that. Uh, well, you know, those things that they talk about, about flying through the atmosphere, they can't really go deep enough to the levels we care about because then they're just too far down and the gravity and everything and the pressure, it doesn't allow them to escape. Right. So the things people have talked about are like, you'll send a balloon and that will have a miniature rocket and the balloon will catch your material and you'll literally have to launch from the balloon. Now the balloon seems to make total sense. But yeah, some people have talked about like a lander that goes to the surface, grabs something and then like launches from the surface. That's a lot harder, but those are the ideas typically. 
wasn't one of the missions because I read that they they were coming up with these materials that could withstand. Uh, you know, it's the electronics, I guess, that's the problem. Yeah. You can get you can right. get stuff down on the planet that can survive the heat, but the electronics basically fry. So it's yeah. it's keeping and you're the right. electronics. You're actually uh, very well read because yes, there's sort of the people who are super excited about being able to operate at really high temperatures, and there's sort of a movement there that yeah. people really want to go to the surface and last you know, instead of for 20 minutes or an hour for probably a few hours or more. Well, anyway, thank you for a very, very interesting talk. I see Ken's hand is up. I think you were up first, Ken. Hi. Oh, now you're oh, muted. The space, there we go. The space bar wasn't unmuting me. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. And um, I can't help... Um, but feel that some of the vitriol has everything to do with the fact that you and your colleague um, in the UK are women. And um, this, my wife um, um, was a major in physics and uh, history of astronomy and got a doctorate and she ran into the same thing. This was back in the seventies um, where she was accused of taking a place from a from a man. You know what was she? She was just going to have children and you know mm -hmm. um, waste the space kind of thing. And uh, so, unfortunately, a lot of that is still around. And that yeah, um, might have been part of that. Um, another I thing people the, didn't. Well, another thing people didn't appreciate was they claimed that uh, most of the people on the team, except for one Japanese scientist who made the models of Venus, all of us were new to Venus. Ah, and people didn't so appreciate that. So maybe it was like the outsider in many sense of the word. A turf war. Yeah. Maybe maybe it was a turf war. I really, uh, yeah, I can't really. It's, it's too bad that, um, and there is a lot of resistance to things that challenge the accepted norm. And right. people really get defensive about it, unfortunately. So yeah, I'm sorry can. you ran into that. It's okay. And I hope it's you good. persevere. And uh, I hope you're proven right. And... Yeah, I just want to say one thing about all of this. While the phosphine debate plays out, uh, the phosphine, it actually opened up so many opportunities. It's kind of a crazy thing. You know, I tried to capture some of those for you. The missions to Venus, the yeah. atmosphere anomalies that people are now revisiting old data, you know, the Pioneer Venus mass spectrometry data. And so there's a lot of new activity on Venus after it being kind of ignored for so long. So that's a really good positive thing to come out of this. Yes, it is. You're muted, Rich. I was going to say, Kenneth, if, unless you have other questions, Mario has his hand up. Um, hi, thank you very much for uh, for an interesting topic. I was wondering if anybody can elaborate on how uh, microbial life on uh, an atmosphere would would work plausible ideas because you know I imagine it would be droplets microbes would be in those droplets uh, but how would all that entail I mean droplets will come together separate rain down yeah uh, that's a great question you're all asking really incisive questions you've asked a very hard question so it turned out a lot of people on the team had that question and they thought I was the only one who could work to answer it so I had to write a paper on this and here's I'll just tell you what I came up with and You'll just, we'll just have to live with this. So these droplets, um, they collide and they grow. There's no opportunity to fragment. You know how here on earth, you, the raindrops, if they go fast enough and they're big enough, they'll, they'll fragment. So the problem is that if there's life reproducing inside a droplet and the droplets grow and get bigger, eventually they fall out of the atmosphere, like rain, but they don't hit the surface. They evaporate before the surface because it's so hot. So the question is, how do the microbes reproduce and stay aloft, right? If they're all in droplets that eventually have to rain out. So what I propose, I'm just <laughs> gonna tell you this, is that, um, so beneath um, Venus, beneath the clouds, there's a layer of haze, like really tiny particles that basically just stay suspended. And so I postulated that perhaps in this layer of haze, there could also be like dried out spore-like material, spores, so that as the droplets grow, they do drop out, but they evaporate as it gets hot. 
and there's just leftover stuff, including some leftover spores. And eventually those spores will get pushed back up into the cloud layer where they can act as like cloud condensation nuclei and the material can aggregate around them and then you start it all over again. So I did write a paper on this. I'm not sure what level of detail that you really care about. And it kind of put together models and put this idea together because it turns out the droplets can stay in the atmosphere depending on their size for months to years. So they actually stay a very long time. It's not like very active and fast moving. Droplets can stay there a long time. And there is a little problem though, because where this haze layer is, it's a very stable layer. And it's not like giant convective cells are constantly like mixing things up. So the only thing that I could come up with on how to get the droplets on or the spores on their way back to the atmosphere are these things called planetary gravity waves. That's not the gravitational waves that you hear about through the universe. These are waves that um, as wind blows over a mountain, for example, it generates a disturbance. Think like an ocean wave. It doesn't move all the ocean, but it moves material. It can like move material slowly. And these are like waves that vertically go in the atmosphere. And they're there. They've been measured on Venus from above from a Japanese orbiter. And just a little thing for you, if you can leave this talk and like have a bunch of things to mull over, we have those on Earth sometimes, actually. And the weirdest thing is they go up in our atmosphere and then they break and then they ripple outward like that. And someone posted this picture on social media uh, from an airplane and they literally had seen clouds that were a product of gravity waves because imagine the wave is like this and it breaks and then it goes like this. And so there were clouds like here, not here, here, not here, here, not here, like stripes. And that was like a product of gravity waves actually. So it's something you can Google later or now and maybe someday you'll get to see that phenomena. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of a weakness of this whole idea is how do they get back up? But that's, okay. it would have to be something like that. Otherwise it makes no sense because we don't think the life forms are freely floating. We think they have to be inside the droplets where they're protected and can have like a miniature ecosystem. Right. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. If you could share a link to that paper you, you mentioned, sure. I'd love, to, I'd love to, to read it over. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. I think Phil had his hand up next. Yeah, I did have a question myself. Sure. Well, well, uh, so when you uh, read us that uh, stuff, like in the meantime, you were speaking, I was also uh, with my uh, with my new uh, computer on the windows going on right, the yeah. widget so I can have like a better understanding of what you were saying not because I wasn't paying attention it was uh, so I was kind of like basically multitasking uh, where I can definitely simultaneously split screens to see if they if they're making more research while you don't have time because you're on uh, zoom taking advantage of my new uh, gadget I got for Christmas. So anyway, back to the chase with my question. So when when you when you get to the research uh, like that about Venus and uh, fo uh, all right, phosphates, uh, whatever it is, uh, did you, do you, so do you ever kind of like get like criticism? Uh, oh, well, that seemed uh, like a uh, well, like hurtful, like people think you're crazy, like you could feel it like they, they learned the hard way. This is no longer a uh, conspiracy, kind of like one of those stories of they, they make a discovery like decades later, or you kind of like in social situations like that when you're doing your research. So are you asking, is there a lot of hurtful criticism or what? Uh, like yeah. thinking that you're kind of uh, like a cray crazy thinking you're yeah. making a conspiracy theory. Uh, um, maybe. I mean, I'm not sure, especially because with COVID, you know, no one's really gone anywhere. So I don't really know what people are thinking except for what's yeah. on Twitter, but I think so. Yeah, because, you of know, the, because of the Venus of thing of people yeah. didn't discover, okay. that's why. <laughs> but, you know, the funny thing is if you look back in history, there were people who did really crazy things like Kepler, you know, Kepler's third, three laws. Oh, uh, little. Okay, bit. you might not know, but Kepler, um, he was like, 
the first astrophysicist. He took orbital data of our planets and our solar system, and he made physical laws to go with them. But they didn't understand the gravity, gravity and such, but you know, he made equations. So he like revolutionized science for us. But Kepler also had some theories that were legitimately crazy. So he was both like kind of brilliant and crazy at the same time. He thought that our solar system contained like perfect solids, like a giant pyramid, a giant cube, a giant sphere. And he had a mathematical theory that those explained the distances between like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Yeah. And I was just hearing today on the radio when I was driving home from work that there's this uh, Nobel laureate who was one of the co-discoverers of the HIV virus. He got a Nobel prize for that. And supposedly like after that, he did, they didn't say what he did, but they called it crazy. Like, so sometimes I don't, maybe, I don't know, maybe it is crazy, you know? Yeah. So people do think that I, I believe. Um, I'm not really I, sure where it's going though. I, I know that like, there have been like some, uh, some store stuff, something. I don't know if I'm getting confused with different history or not. I do know that Albert Einstein was an example. People didn't understand what he was talking about when they realized he was not making a conspiracy theory after all. That's when they like found out the evidence. People didn't discover things that all or they didn't see the evidence until decades later. Right. I mean, I don't know. It would be funny if someone accused us of making a conspiracy theory about phosphine just so we could get all those other things. The missions <laughs> to Venus, all the attention on Venus, all the new ideas. I don't know. I'm just kind of joking, but you kind of see like a slant on that. <laughs> Yeah, Phil, well, thanks for your Phil, question. Thanks for your question. I'm going to move over to Brewster. All He's right, got his you're hand welcome. Up. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thanks, Rich. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for speaking with us tonight. I'm curious, and I, I somewhere on my bookshelf, I have a book about the atmosphere of Jupiter. And I seem to remember a lot of interest in the gases there. And I remember phosphine is one of the things that came up. So, how much of the I'll say prior research on phosphine and the gases in Jupiter atmosphere, because I'm pretty sure they decided at some point that life was not a possibility there. And it, if anything, Jupiter seems, it's got water vapor, it's got much more benign conditions. Seems that would be more likely if I had to pick a place to go. What, what can you say about the you know, historical research and how does that apply to what you're doing now? Sure. Well, phosphine on Venus is there, uh, it's like, they're naturally, for lack of a better word, because Jupiter has a lot of hydrogen. So phosphorus, you know, can go with hydrogen because there's so much hydrogen. Also, as you go down beneath the atmosphere of Jupiter, it's very, very hot and high pressure. So all those conditions want, it, phosphine wants to exist. It's thermodynamically favored, it's energetically feasible. And that phosphine can get dredged up because Jupiter has giant convective, vigorous convection, convective cells. So phosphines on Venus, that's been researched. People more or less understand that. Now people did, Carl Sagan did say, could there be life on Venus? And he had some pretty, well, for lack of a better word to touch on what we just talked about, crazy ideas. Maybe there's like giant balloon type life. The problem on Jupiter compared to Venus is it, it has vigorous convection. So any life will be not just raining out in droplets, but it'll be brought down to these really hot layers that are way too hot for life of any kind. Venus doesn't have that, you know? There's stable layers without vigorous activity. So the droplets might fall, but they have a time to evaporate. And what's ever inside those droplet, now lighter, can linger. So people have thought about Jupiter, but because of what I explained about this convection, I've ruled it out. Now, Carl Sagan wrote about some, uh, let's say, pretty crazy stuff. Like maybe there's some balloon type life that can force itself to stay buoyant. You know, so, I mean, I don't know, you could argue that why not look there too. But for those reasons, people generally don't. All right, makes sense. Like I said, I'm just curious. It seemed yeah. like, you know, at some level, it's uh, inhospitable to, you know, us carbon-based life forms, but maybe for the types of things that, seem to be proposed and it comes by why not Jupiter then too. Thank yeah. you. Okay. I don't see any other hands up, Sarah. Any other questions? Rich, Sarah. I've got one. Oh, sure, go ahead. 
Is, is that John? John, go ahead. It is, thank you. Uh, Professor Seeger, so turning away from Venus just for the moment, um, does phosphine have uh, identifiable or prominent spectral lines that JWST can look for on exoplanets, putting on your exoplanet hat? Right, right. So that's kind of how I got into this in the first place. Like it technically does have lines that James Webb Space Telescope can look at. But all that said, the search for gases made by life is going to be incredibly challenging for the James Webb Space Telescope. Right now, if you wanna ask, I'm sort of answering a slightly different question, but rocky planets in the habitable zone of their host star, the ones accessible to the James Webb, there's about three of them. There's not very many of them. So there have to be like a lot of really lucky things to happen. And the first set of observations of these rocky worlds, it's just to establish they have atmospheres at all. And the next step might be to spend more time on them looking for water vapor, which might indicate a liquid water ocean. And then to look for phosphine, it could be like so much telescope time required that it might not even be feasible. So technically the answer is yes. So if there are giant planets that have it, are there any really cold giants we can look at, then yes. But as an indicator of life, there's other reasons why it would be really hard to find. Thank you. Sarah, is there anything, you know, the ability to look at exoplanet atmospheres, how far down the line do you think that technology might be? Well, we've looked at like 50 to 100 exoplanet atmospheres already with Hubble for planets that transit, planets that go in front of the star as seen from the observatory. Mm -hmm. And there are some planets that are very far from the star. They're hot, they're young, and those have been observed by ground-based telescopes. So what James Webb will do is it will, it's gonna be huge for exoplanet atmospheres, mostly for giant planets and Neptune size and smaller planets. It's gonna to struggle to do things with rocky worlds, but on the whole, it's gonna just blow your mind. Like. Uh, you'll have to wait a couple of years because the James Webb will start taking science data in the summer. And by the time data gets in people's hands and they analyze it, it's probably another six months. So for everything to trickle down, it's probably a year or more. Sure, sure. That's awesome. That's really exciting. So I'm, I'm so happy James Webb is at L2 and seems to be healthy and a fully functioning telescope. That's fantastic. Um, any other questions? Well, Sarah, thank you so much what a, for a, a, wonderful, um, a wonderful presentation tonight, very engaging, and um, we really appreciate your time and uh, expertise. Um, you're welcome to stick around. I'm going to officially end the meeting for a second, and then what we typically do is hang out for another, you know, eh, an hour, um, just to chatting, and you're welcome to stick around with us, or if you have other things to do, we can certainly do. understand. It's it. getting towards my bedtime, so I definitely <laughs> have stuff to do. So I just want to say thanks for being a great audience and for your great questions, and I wish you all clear skies. Thank you, Sarah. Have a wonderful mm -hmm. evening. Be well. Thank you. Take care. Well, let me share my screen one last time, if I can get it to come up, and I'll, I'll officially end the meeting um, by telling you that our next monthly meeting will be on March 10th at eight o'clock. I'll open the doors at 7.45 like I always try to do. And the next ATMA board meeting is on Thursday, March 24th.